my settings just reset when I switched over from YouTube to Twitch. I'm sorry, it's taking a while. There's almost no, no similarities. Oh, and Twitch is so difficult to figure out. Okay, so the title is there. Notifications there. Da -da. Tags are there. Forgot that. You got music, you hear me. I am recording. Yes, I am. Let me check. Is that ready to go? Yes, that's ready to go. These are all ready. Ready. Uh oh. Oh, wait, no, we're here. We're good, we're good. We're good there, 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 there. Okay. Hi! I think we're ready. Yeah, we're ready. Hi! Commander, commanding philosopher Poison Tongue, reporting back on a whole different platform this time. I have no idea what I'm doing. But Twitch, I gotta tell you, is a very strange, very strange experience if you've never done it before. And I apologize for being a bit late. My first time ever being late. Um, but I had pierogies for lunch. They took a bit while, took a bit longer to make than I expected, and they were really good, and there was a lot. So pierogies are done. I had to rush through them. They're not bad. I think they were authentically Polish. At least that's what the restaurant said. Take that for the take that face value. Okay, I am... That's that. Okay, so today, we're just going to go with it. Today, this stream is, as the title hopefully says, yes, the title says, Cooking Ingredient Beginning Essentials. Okay, so last time, last time, we talked about my top 12, top 10, top somewhat, some however number, of ingredient, of tools, tools to have during, um, cooking if you're if you're trying to start you know expanding your culinary expertise and trying to venture in the world of the of the cooking arts and you just wanted to dab get your toes a bit wet but have a little more a little more um, commitment to it and I gave you a list of generic tools that for the most part were very versatile in their usage very uh, multi-application well, today we're doing the counterpart to that, a list of food, a list of ingredients that are also multi-applicable, very versatile, but also working with these foods will develop valuable skills that then translate to different uh, foods and have a wide range of uh, potential expansion of your skills. Now, I noticed after writing my list together that all the, all the tools you would need to properly work with these ingredients were not actually on that list. So if you just go by the list I gave you last week, you'll actually be missing some stuff that you'd need in order to fully use everything onto th this week's list. So that was a bit of an oversight on my part. But I'm just going to go ahead, and again, you can cherry pick, pick and choose whichever ones you want to listen to, whichever ones you want to try with. I'm just going to share my experience um, <clears throat> working with these ingredients and understanding how, how the skills that they have imparted upon me have allowed me to transfer those skills to other ingredients. So we're going to go right into it. We're going to start. Uh, I have two... Yeah, just two main categories of food, and there's five ingredients on each category. So the first category is going to be versatility. Now the whole list is meant for versatility, but these first five are really, really the heavy hitters. So let's see if I can transition properly. transition to you. Okay, I think I'm still moving. I'm still moving. That works. Okay, I think we're good. So, the first on the list is onion. Now, a little disclaimer before we really jump into things. Sometimes 
you may end up working with foods that, personally, you don't like. Um, but still, if you're cooking for, say, a large group or for just a, one other person and it's their favorite food, for instance, it's good to know how to work with these foods. Like, personally, I never used to like onions. But by working with them and exploring all the different ways you can prepare them, you can cook them, you can present them, it's one of my favorite foods to cook with, even if it's not one of my favorite foods to enjoy the flavor of. It's, it's gone beyond tolerable to somewhat enjoyable in certain contexts, but I think that's just what exposure to, a cert, to any sort of food will give you. Now, for instance, I'm not a huge fan of carrots, and I'm not a huge fan of broccoli rabe. A lot of people don't know what broccoli rabe is, they think I'm mispronouncing broccoli or misidentifying spinach, but broccoli rabe is, is, it, is, it, is a food, actually, let me... Yeah, I'll look it up later. Broccoli rabe is a food. I don't like the flavor, at least in all the ways that I've had it prepared for me. Um, and carrots, they have a very distinct flavor. I do not like <laughs> that flavor. But I know multiple ways to prepare them and how to cook them. Because when they're mixed with other foods, either the flavor disappears or the flavor gets paired with another flavor that makes it taste tolerable, or luckily, if we're lucky, better and enjoyable. So yeah, so anything on this list that you see, if your immediate inclination is, oh, I don't, I don't like that, I'm not going to work with that, well, give it a shot. Give it a chance. And that's really what this whole, whole experience, this whole lecture thing is about, just trying something new. Learning a skill. Maybe you have a knack for it that is, as of yet, untapped. So we're going to explore it, and I'm going to do my darn best to help you. So the first thing on the list is the onion. The onion is probably one of the most versatile foods in terms of learning how to develop your cooking skills and learning how to develop your preparation skills and your, um, not just your palate and not just your nose. Palate is like your taste, nose is your smell, but also your eyes eyes in terms of knowing how far along a, could, a, a food is being cooked. So here we go. And we're just going to be on this, on this one screen, just showing you all the different onions here. Um, so the onions, I have it split into a 5-4-3 kind of rule. Five cuts, four modes, and three colors. So let me explain. If you're starting to work with preparing food on your own, I would recommend starting with all the different ways you can prepare, cook, and identify onions. Five ways to prepare. You can dice them. And for those that are unfamiliar with these terms, I'm not going to assume that you know what, I, what they are, but I also don't want to come across as condescending. So just to be safe, I'm going to quickly explain what I mean as I say it. So when you dice, you literally are turning them into cubes, like, like a pair of dice that you roll. You can have them in large chunk, large little cubes, or super fine, very thin little, little bits. And that just depends on um, either how you want them to look, or how you want them to, what role you want them to play in your dish. And we'll touch on that when we get to the four modes. But for the five cuts, the first cut is dice. It's one of the most common when you're preparing an onion that tries to interweave seamlessly in any dish, whether it's a stir-fry or a fried rice or a, um, you know, going on a sandwich. Most often, there's diced onions. I think uh, McDonald's hamburgers, they have diced onions. I don't think they have um, intact. The second one would be strips, and those are essentially just half circle, semicircles, very thin. It's like you took a single piece of a diced onion and just extruded it out, just extended it into a sort of rainbowish kind of loop. And those strips are very good if you want more of a crunch. The dice onions doesn't really lend itself to being very crunchy because they're so small. But the 
onions, cutting them into strips, definitely allows you to have that crunch while not having too much of a presence to overpower any other ingredient in the dish. Um, you would have onion strips if you wanted to make, like, um, I don't know, again, a go, go with a stir fry. If you do diced onions in a stir fry, the onions will essentially disappear. They'll vanish. But if you do stripped onions, onions in strips, <laughs> then they'll have more of a presence and they'll become a noticeable part of the finished product. You can also cut them into... Oh, uh, for diced, you would do, as the, as the purple onion shows here, you would cut them in half, down the middle, and then you chop them into, into diced pieces, or you can cut them into strips, like this. For rings, you would leave the onion intact, and you would just cut along this way as opposed to cutting down here and then cutting along lengthwise. You cut just across the belly and you create rings. Things like this are good for onion rings or for putting on things like hamburgers. They, if you're lucky, you find an onion that is thinner in diameter than the actual patty and then you just layer them and then you have a nice little crunch all the way through. Most um, most sit-down restaurants do it like this. And then you have what I call sheets. Now, sheets, you can't, I can't really find a good picture of what I call sheets, but oh, there's some rings right there. Yeah, so sheets are where you kind of cut it like... The best example is actual food. If you go to a place like a steakhouse, like uh, Outback, for instance, and you get their blooming onion. The onion that is crispified, I think that's the word, it's not a diced, it's a very wide strip. And so I'd say when the strip is wide enough, it becomes a sheet, it's not a ring. So that's really the only difference between a strip and a sheet is how wide the, the actual strip is. It's kind of an art, kind of up to you, whether you call it a sheet or a strip. But when I say a sheet, I don't mean it's a full semicircle like a strip is, like the full length of the onion. I'd say maybe it cuts down the middle and it's like a quarter or half the circle. So a quarter circle and then it's cut in half and it's rather wide. Those are very good for if you're baking onion. Say if you're making sausage, pepper, and onion. You put the, uh, your bell peppers, you put in your sausage, and then you put in your onions. If you put them as sheets, they have a lot of surface area. They'll leak out a lot of their flavor, and they'll become nice and soft and very tasty. You could also do that with diced onions, but they'll disappear. You can do that with strips. They'll, they're very small, so they will also disappear. Rings, if you cut them very thick rings, maybe, but there are a lot, the bigger the ring, the harder it is to eat, and you're just gonna end up cutting them anyway, so why not just pre-cut them into sheets? So we got diced onions, we have stripped onions, we have rings onions, and we have sheet onions. And the last one is, uh, let me see if I have the picture. Uh, da, 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 da. They don't have a good picture of just a peeled onion, they all have the skin on it. But the last one is really just a whole onion, just completely un unpeeled. And that is what I just call trimmed and whole. Now you don't just rip off the, the skin and you leave it as is. You would actually trim off this top part, which is like the, you can see right here, it's kind of the tail. I don't know what that's called, but you would trim it like right around there. And then this part that has the hair on it, that's called, I think, the root of the onion and you trim that off carefully very carefully because the root of the onion has all the stuff in it that makes you cry when you're cutting onions if you can cut through or cut off the root of the onion properly you won't cry when people cry cutting onions is because they cut into it too much and they start releasing the chemicals they don't properly get rid of the root of the onion um, and how you get rid of the root really depends on how you're cutting the onion. If you're cutting it into dice or strips or sheets, then you would really cut your, your cut up until just before the root, make all your cuts, 
and then you're left with just the root by itself, and then you throw it away. If you're making she uh, rings, you might want to just cut the root off right away, but you wouldn't do it close. You can't really, I wonder if there's a zoomed in picture, but I guess this is the best one. You see it's kind of the hair right here, but then it kind of goes a little more golden deep here, and over here is where it finally starts to turn white. You don't want to cut into that brown part. That's still part of the root. You want, if you want to cut across, you want to make sure you're above that part. So cut off there, and then trim off whatever actual onion parts are on the leftover part, and then you're just left with a, a relatively intact root and no tears whatsoever. So there's a lot of different choices for cutting onions. You can dice them, cut them into strips, cut them into rings, cut them into sheets, or just trim the root and the tail and peel them and then leave them whole. If you want to cook a raw onion, I don't really know what you would do with a raw onion, but it's good if you want to cut it say into rings or into sheets, but you don't want to do it right now. You want to save the onion. Then you can just cut the whole thing, cut half of it, use half, and store the other half in, the, in a Ziploc bag in your fridge for later. They keep for a while. So, onions. Very good at practicing your knife work. Remember all the time that I spent talking about the kitchen knife, how important that was? Well, the onion is pretty much the number one food to practice your knife skills on. Uh, getting real close and real fine with your chops for dice, uh, getting used to the long strokes with the strips, getting used to consistent cuts and being consistent with every cut using the rings, getting an idea of visually uh, determining uh, essentially size, portion control with the sheets. And then the trim is really just the easiest part. It's not really practicing the knife skills, but yeah, so each of the four cuts uh, determines a different, well, not determines, benefits a different type of knife work. Whew, that's onions. We're only a third of the way through. Okay, so I mentioned five cuts, four modes, and three colors. We finished the five cuts, now we're on to the four modes. The four modes of cooking are baking, grilling, boiling, and sauteing. Now you can bake an onion, and that will make it very soft. If you bake it long enough, it will leak all its flavors into whatever dish you have, and it'll become a not almost not crunchy at all, almost like you can cut through it with a butter knife with ease. That's very, again very good for like a nice sausage and peppers dish, or a casserole, or any large family sized uh, traditional food. You can also grill them. Grilling is good if you want to use um, on like a hamburger or a hot dog. For a grill though, it depends on the kind of grill, but you want your onions to be big. Not just so a lot of, not, you know, not just so they fall through the rings and into the coals or into the fire. You want them to be big, but also the more area you have, the more of that charred flavor you get, the more flavorful they become. Versus if they're very tiny, let's say you cut them into, if a big onion, you cut them into strips and you flatten them out so they don't fall through. Well, they're very small, there's not a whole lot of flavor in that tiny little strip as opposed to a thick ring. So you're kind of getting just a charry flavor, but not a whole lot of the cooked onion flavor. You want a lot of onion when you're, when you're grilling. So that's why I would recommend using either uh, large chunks of onion or just use uh, rings when you're grilling onions. Very good on hamburgers and sometimes on hot dogs. Hot dogs are more, yeah, maybe you bake them. Yeah, baked onions are better, I think, for hot dogs. Grilled onions are better for hamburgers. You could also boil them if you're making a soup or a stew or a chowder. You can boil the onions. Uh, and here, smaller the better. Actually, no, I take that back. It really depends. If you cut them small, like dice or strips, actually, no, dice or sheets, then they'll just tumble over each other and they'll cook, but they'll kind of shrink and disintegrate. If you cut them big, like strips or rings, they may take a bit longer to lose their crunchiness, 
but they will definitely become more noticeable. Same thing for uh, the stir fry. The bigger, the more noticeable. The smaller, they become more like a like a, a backdrop, kind of a, not really a glue, but like a like a, an overall consistent theme in the background that holds the dish together, but doesn't bring any extra attention to itself. Again, personal preference, and just experiment with different techniques. And then finally, sauté. Sauté is just you cook it on a frying pan in oil. Stir fries are often sautés. And the oil, especially if you mix in a little salt, gets the onions to transform, I think, the most, uh, in, the, early, in the most visual way. What do I mean by that? I mean our next phase, the three colors. Three colors of the onion, when they're raw, when they're cooked two different ways. When they're raw, they are very solid white, rather opaque, and some people like it. They have a very distinct flavor, very distinct texture. When you cook them in, say, uh, you bake them, or you uh, saute them at a low heat slowly, or you boil them, they can turn, depending on the color of the onion, say if you're using just a regular white onion, they can turn transparent almost, almost see-through or barely noticeable. And that usually comes with a very soft, very uh, melty, like a meltable texture and flavor. And again, that has its benefits and uh, disadvantages. And the final color is darkened. This is what you get when you grill it or when you saute it at a high heat with only a tiny bit of oil or a very particular type of oil. It's when you get that char. On a grill, you get the very dark, almost black char, because that's from the actual flame and the heat. But if you saute it in a frying pan, you don't really get a black char, you get a brown char. It's kind of caramelizing. And it becomes like a brownish gold. And it's mostly apparent when you do either strips or diced onions because most of the surface area of the onion is actually resting on the surface of the pan. If you do a ring, it's only just a slight ring, but most of the onion is either on the sides or on the top. It's not touching it. Or if you do a sheet, it's sometimes they're curved, they don't fall on, and a whole onion, forget about it. But the dice and the strips are the ones that get the caramelized the quickest. And that creates a, a third type of flavor, a very savory flavor, despite it being a vegetable. And honestly, that's one of my favorite ways to eat onions, when it's darkened and caramelized, especially with uh, diced onions. If I have diced, caramelized onions, you can cook those up ahead of time and say you're building uh, a fancy hamburger from scratch. So you have your, your meat, your mix, and your, 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 uh, your seasoning, like salt, pepper, garlic, whatever. You can pre-cook your onions to caramelize them and then put those caramelized onions in your burger mix before it's cooked. So now that altered onion flavor is part of your onion rather than part of your burger rather than the raw onion flavor. You're just altering the flavor ahead of time. So again, you can get creative. You can get crazy. You can do all sorts of things. There's no limit and there's no judgment until whatever you want to try. The only things that could potentially judge you are your fire alarm. <laughs> so be careful, especially if you're doing a lot of indoor cooking at high heat, or cooking a lot of foods with a lot of water inside them, mixing with oil, because that can be explosive in a very dangerous way. So be careful. So for onions, we talked about the five cuts to practice your knife work, the four modes to practice working with different tools, working with your toaster oven working with a grill, working with a pot, working with a pan. And then we talked about our three colors to working with different flavors. The raw flavor, the soft transparent flavor, or the caramelized darkened flavor. You can do so much, so many things with onions just to experiment all your different cooking skills. You can spend a whole month just practicing and refining and mastering all these skills and almost all of them, almost all of them, 
from the knife work to the cuts, to the modes of cooking, to the uh, knowing what colors tend to give you what flavors, translate to almost to so many other foods that the onion is like the ultimate kickoff point for any other food you're going to venture into. So, suffice to say, if you're starting to learn how to cook, start with an onion. And that is, I think, 1, 5 times 4 is 20, times 3 is 60. So that's 60... Actually, you know, we'll forget the trim and holes. So that's 4, 4, 16 times 3. That's 8 times 6 is 48. So 48 different... <laughs> you can cook 48 different onion combinations of the four cuts minus the whole onion, the four modes, and the three colors, depending on your equipment. And once you know how to do that with confidence, then it'll show when you start to cook a food like you've never cooked before. You can still take these same concepts and apply them, and most of the time you'll be your intuition will be correct by this point. That's what I love about cooking. I love that there's, no matter how different the food is, no matter what part of the world it comes from, or how, uh, how it's cultivated, whether it's cultivated deep in the ocean, or under, like, a, like a sea urchin, or deep in, or underground like a potato, or high in the tree like a pineapple, or even high, up in high elevation like one of those mangoes from Peru. There are some constants, and once you learn those constants, you'll be able to pretty much guess with good accuracy how to make it taste good. And it'll only bolster your confidence, and you'll be creating wonderfully tasting dishes left and right. Alright, so, the next food, list number two is... Broccoli! So for broccoli... You can do a lot of the stuff with broccoli that you can do with onions. So I'm not going to go over the intricacies of why broccoli is better or worse than an onion. We already talked about the cuts, modes, and colors. I want to... We're, we're moving on to an onion, which is really just one consistent kind of material all throughout, just the body of the onion, to a broccoli, which has essentially two types. You have the crown, or the head of the onion, and you have the stem. They look different, they feel different, they taste different, and they can be cooked different ways. And when they do cook, they react differently. Even though they're two parts of the same food, cooking with broccoli opens you up to the concept of knowing what kind of things to look for and what kind of things um, will and might not work. So the two points I want to make about broccoli are how you can cook the head differently from the stem, or you can cook it together. If you're making a stir-fry, um, there's a type of broccoli called a baby broccoli, or broccoli, broccolini, I think it's called, broccolini, where it's basically, it's not a powdery, uh, I wonder if I can find, see these are all long, uh, poofy, poofy broccolis. Broccolini? There we go. Broccolini. So it's like this. So it's a kind of a thinner crown, but a very long stem. But overall, it's not very big. Not very big. Like there's a hand. This is a very large broccolini. It's meant to be kind of small. So, if you cut them maybe once down the about lengthwise, that's pretty good, and you kind of can't really... That's really it, you, all you need. But I'm talking more about the crown broccoli, where there is a distinct difference between the head and the stem. So you can treat the head and crown, head or crown, whatever you want to call it, the crown or head of the broccoli very similar to how you would treat a broccolini. You can mix it in with any, any stir fries or any um, baked dishes. You can roast them. Um, roasted broccoli is actually very good. You just put them on a tray, cut drizzle in a little salt, pepper, and olive oil, and you just bake them at like 425 or something for about 10-15 minutes. 
You'll see it starting to get a little dark, like a little charred on the crown. That's how you know it's ready. And it tastes so good. And I leave the stem on. But if you're cooking, say, like a broccoli soup, or you want to mix it into like a, a, a spaghetti or a pasta, like a marinara sauce, you're making a very fancy vegetable-filled sauce for like a pasta or a, a ravioli or a sausage roll or something, then you can cut off at the crown and then chop up the crown into little pieces and all little hairs will kind of just fall apart, all just disintegrate. And the flavor will still be there, it'll be very floury. In complete contrast, the stem, really no matter how much you cook it, unless you're very patient, you cook it for a very long time, it will still maintain its crunch. The head might fall apart, but the stem will maintain a crunch. So if you want a food that needs a crunch, add the stems in. Like a stir fry. I'm always going back to stir fry, but that's a very good basic dish to cook for a beginner. You throw in some noodles, some meat, and then some vegetables. The noodles are soft, the meats will probably be soft, you might throw in an egg in there to wrap it all together, that'll be soft, so soft, 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 you need some sort of crunch. Broccoli, and if you cook, throw onions in there, depending on how you cook the onions, the onions can also be soft. So broccoli gives you that crunch, and it's mostly the stem that does the work, because the crown will also go, go soft. But the other point I want to bring up with broccoli is a concept that is, that is uh, applicable to most vegetables and most meats is uh, color changing. Broccoli, will, the head of the broccoli is a very light, very kind of faded green. But as soon as you add it to heat, it becomes a very strong, rich, vibrant green. And it's such a beautiful color especially when you're cooking with it and you can see the color change right before your eyes. All it takes is a couple seconds and you can see the color just... So I thought someone knocking at my door. You can just see the color just like brighten and become so vibrant and it's like, oh, someone just turned up the, the color, the HD quality on your eyeballs. <laughs> it's, it's really cool just watching it turn green. The stem doesn't change color, but the crown does. And so if you're going for a visually appealing dish and you want a very strong green presence, go with a broccoli head. Go with a broccoli crown. Make sure it's cooked. Don't serve it raw. It'll still look kind of raw. But if you cook it, it'll become this bright green and it'll lift the color of any dish you throw it in. Even if you put it into the thickest, uh, strongest red marinara sauce, you'll still see that bright green shining through. That's how powerful it is. And that concept applies to other foods like mushrooms or uh, sometimes onions or even other like a lot of some herbs the color will either strengthen or and or darken when it's cooked well enough to eat mushrooms for instance especially if you get white mushroom white mushrooms those are the best ones because they're the most obvious with their color change i didn't throw them on here because they'd have the same concept of the broccoli minus the flavor switch. But mushrooms, you start with white, you add a little oil, you cook them, and eventually they'll start turning a bit brown. And when they're brown on the inside, they're nice and soft, they're very flavorful, you know they're cooked. So the color change, you don't have to always taste it. You don't have to cut into it and ruin a presentation. Like if you're trying to cook a sausage, you don't have to cut into it or even stab it stab like a vegetable with a, with a food thermometer, you can just tell based on the color, oh, that looks good, it's probably good. So let's say if you don't want to cut into it or you don't get a food thermometer, you can still have color as a reliable indicator. And every food has its own color patterns, relationship to how well it's cooked, so that just comes with experience. Broccoli changes color very fast, almost on contact, to heat. Mushrooms take almost forever to change color. Onions, if you cook them at high heat with a non-stick pan, it can still take a while, but it takes just about as much time for it to turn transparent at a low heat. So learning all these combinations becomes really useful. Okay, uh, we talked about onion, we talked about... So that's all I gotta say about broccoli. 
The third food I would recommend you start working with is pasta. Now I have angel hair up here, but that's just one of the many different types. And here is where I would recommend using different types of pasta for different applications. I would cut it into three categories. You got string pasta, flat pasta, and tubular or tube pasta. So the string pasta, like you see angel here, angel hair, or just regular thicker spaghetti noodles. Angel hair is very thin and it cooks very fast. It's really good for like a shrimp scampi or for coating a lot of, getting a lot of, lot of a bulk to your dish without having a lot of, like, like you're here, like if you're spinning it around. Very thin, it spins very easily. Oh, these are fancy. But yeah, some foods that have a lot of like spinach here, like this twirls. You can twirl the noodles, you'll twirl this leaf of spinach right with it. So if you have a lot, lot ah, can't speak. If you have a lot of leafy greens, or if you have a lot of, you know, soft foods or saucy foods, maybe the string pasta is the best choice for you. And they tend to cook rather quickly. But depending on if it's like a regular pasta, whole wheat, or if it's like a lentil pasta, or if it's a, you know, like a cauliflower noodle, they all cook different ways. The second way, the second type is flat. Now flat is like farfalle, or farfalle, I think it's farfalle, which you just call them bow tie, or lasagna. Now the benefit of working with a flat noodle is there's a lot of surface area. And if you don't rinse the, the pasta too much, after you cook it, it still has a lot of that starch clinging to it, even if you rinse it a little bit. And then it's really good at sticking to thicker sauces, like an Alfredo, or like a, like a very oily sauce. The flat surface area of the noodle will hold a lot of that flavor, so if you have a lot of uh, cut up herbs in your dish, like you chop up some cilantro and some chives and maybe a little bit of parsley and maybe some oregano. Well, the flat surface area will grab onto that and each individual noodle, each forkful of noodle will have a lot more flavor than just a string noodle, which really only pick up whatever it happens to cross by, but it's so thin, it doesn't always pick up that much. That's why lasagnas Flat noodles, they're very good when you're mixing with cheese and sauce. The cheese makes it all sticky, and with a flat noodle, there's a lot of surface area to stick to. So it works out. If you're doing uh, butter, just regular butter noodles, just as a snack, string pasta may not be the best choice for that. But, but farfalle, I keep wanting to say falafel, but farfalle noodles, maybe, it'll stick to the butter a bit better. And if you're really, really enthusiastic sauce or butter or uh, liquidy aficionado, you might like the third type, tubular pasta. We have penne here, but I'm also referring to the elbow style, the macaroni style. A penne, it's basically like a little tube, which is essentially like a little bucket for whatever sauce you have. If it's not a very, it's a very viscous sauce, like tomato sauce or uh, pesto, then it'll get lodged inside the noodle and it won't leave. And the noodle itself will essentially be a little carrying case for that sauce. Especially if you don't have a lot of noodles. A lot of sauce to a little noodles, it's gotta go somewhere. But if you have a very viscous, like hot butter, it might just Kind of fill the noodle and then as soon as you pick it up it'll drop right out of it back into the bowl it'll coat the inside of the noodle sure which is a benefit but might as well just go with a flat noodle have it kind of picked up long surface area with that so yeah so learning how to cook pasta and the applications with pasta you can put almost anything with cooked noodles so if you're not sure about trying a new food cook some noodles to go with it to act as a buffer to throw in other sauces, other stuff. Like if you're trying to cook a like a, like a piece of like like pork chops, for instance. 
you've never cooked pork chop, for instance, then maybe you want to try it, but you want to make sure that it's not a total loss if you don't like it. So maybe you'll throw in a little sauce or a little herbs to go with it, but you also want to let the flavor of the pork chop shine through by itself and not just be entirely supported by all the extra stuff you threw on there. So you can add some noodles. Throw all the sauce and all the flavors into the noodle dish and then have the pork chop separate so then you can mix it in at a later time or you can keep it separate depending on how you want to do it. So as the chef, as the cook, you have that control. You have all that flexibility, all those choices to make, all that freedom of how you want to mix and match when you're experimenting with something new. You can create a dish that's half safety foods, foods that you cooked before that you know is going to taste good, and half experimental foods, foods that you try and cooking for the first time, you have no idea how it's going to taste, but just in case it's a complete and total wash, you have the other half. And in case it's really good, you can complement it with the other half to, as you're sitting down and eating, trying new different food and texture combinations. So even during the eating process, sometimes you're still experimenting and thinking. It's, I love it. It's an ongoing art and it's so much fun. Okay, that's noodles. Next up are eggs. You can hard boil eggs, you can fry an egg, you can scramble egg, you can poach an egg. And I would recommend trying all four. But the first thing I would do, and then once you try it a couple times, not worry about it ever again, focus on other things and learning how to crack an egg without it falling into a complete mess within your fingers. Like me, I've been doing work with eggs for a long time. I can get to the point where I can just hold it with one hand, crack it on one hit, crack it open and toss it all without using a second hand. Just like one, crack, boom, two, crack, three, boom, crack, and done. Yeah, I've been, a luckily, there is rare when I get to do it that quickly, but I have been able to do it that quickly before. And that's just with working with knowing the exact place and where to crack them and all that stuff. But assuming you've got them cracked and ready to go, I would try those four different ways of cooking them. Frying an egg, it's pretty simple. Put on medium high to high heat, put a little oil or a little butter in the frying pan, you crack an egg right into it, one or two, you just sit there and wait until the liquid on the bottom starts to rise up and kind of wobble and flutter because it's no longer liquid on the bottom. It's no longer stuck to and attached to the frying pan, it's solid. So then you just kind of flip it one time, sprinkle it with a little salt and pepper on the solidified part. You don't want to add salt to the, to the liquefied egg white or egg yolk because it'll interact with the liquid egg and it'll start to mess with it, make it a weird texture. But if you add the salt to the solidified egg, it's already resistant to any chemical interactions that the salt will cause with the liquid form. So it's safer to add the seasoning there. So wait until the egg is solidified on one side, then you season it with salt and pepper. And then again, wait until it's back and forth and you just keep flipping until either it's up to where you want it, whether it's a couple, like a very dark brown on both sides, or if the, the egg white is cooked and the inside may be a little runny. I think over egg over, what's it called? Eggs over medium, I think. That's really good with rice. Kind of a bit of a tangent, but if you cook an egg over medium, where the egg white is solid, but the yolk is runny, and you put it over a tiny bowl of rice, and then you mix it all in, the solid egg white, the liquid egg yolk, and the cooked white rice, the sticky rice. Oh my god, it's one of the... Oh, and you throw some salt, pepper, and sesame seeds in there. Oh, it's one of the best breakfasts ever. It is so good. I totally recommend you try it. Absolutely recommend you try it. Just cook a little white rice. You can go to Costco and get those little pre, like, microwavable 90-second white rice, sticky rices. Just cook that all the way. Cook an egg over medium. Put one on top of the other. Mix it up, throw some sesame seeds in there, seasoning. Oh, it's so good. It's so, it's so good. It's so good. But yeah, fry an egg. <laughs> if 
You could also scramble the egg. The process for scrambling an egg is really just put them in a bowl, take a fork or a whisk, or a knife if you need to, but mostly just a fork or a whisk, and just beat it. Just back and forth, just like, you don't even need to go in circles. You just need to go back and forth, side to side, up and down. Make sure you like break up each yolk first to make it easier to fall apart, and then you just mix it around until it's kind of a solid color, solid consistency. And then once your pan is nice and hot, you just pour it in. And then after that, with just a lower heat and a little longer time, it's the exact same process as the fried egg. You wait till the bottom is kind of solidified, and then instead of flipping it, you kind of stir it around. Drag the edges in towards the center. Make as big folds of curds or make it tiny in shreds. It depends on how vigorously and how often you mix it around and what instrument, what instrument, what tool you use. If you use a wooden spoon, you can drag it in, but you could also rip it apart. If you use a spatula, a rubber spatula, it'll maintain its large um, curd size because you don't have the roughness of a wooden spoon to break it apart. So if you want like big, flavorful scrambled egg chunks, I would recommend using a, wood, a rubber spatula. And don't stir too much. Just enough so that it's cooked, it's not runny or watery anymore, but it doesn't get all dry and shriveled and crispy or rubbery, because that's overcooked. But yeah, here, right here is an example of eggs over medium, solid white, and liquidy yolk. This is sunny side up. Personally, I always get a little paranoid. I mentioned this when talking about the food thermometer. I always get a little paranoid about food being undercooked, so I will not eat sunny side up eggs. As long as the egg looks like this on top, I will not eat it. Because I can't trust that this white that's on top is fully cooked and doesn't contain any salmonella and will kill me. Will not kill me. You can also See, like this, these curds are kind of on the small side. These are a bit bigger. They don't have a good ex good example of the... I guess this one is kind of big. Some are creamy, some are curdy. Like this one, if, if this was more solidified curds. Or like this. Yeah, so, experiment not just with different cooking styles, but also with different tools. Because it didn't really play a part with the onion, broccoli, and pasta, but sometimes the tool that you use to cook with can determine how food actually gets cooked and how it ends up. So the combinations are really endless, and it's all just a fun experiment trying out different ones. Okay, uh, we talked about fried, we talked about scrambled. Uh, I'm just gonna do the one that's facing right here, hard-boiled. Hard-boiled. Um, there's many different rules online about how to cut, how to cook hard-boiled eggs, and most of them disagree with each other. Personally, I take the egg, I make the water boil first, and then I just dip them into the boiling water for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I put them into a bowl of chilled water with ice cubes in it, so flash freeze them for about, I don't know, an hour or so. Usually I make the eggs the night before I want to use them, so I leave them in the fridge overnight. And then, by cooking them immediately hot and then flash freezing them cold, in theory, that makes them a lot easier to peel because they don't stick to the shell as much if you suddenly heat and then suddenly cool. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But using hard-boiled eggs, it's good for salads. It's really, it's necessary for making deviled eggs. Deviled eggs are incredible. They are so delicious. Especially if you make them, well, the way I do. <laughs> you just throw in the egg yolk, you, you stir it with a fork until it's all dry, and then you throw in some salt, some pepper, and maybe a little garlic powder, and you stir that up until it's all just a dry, fine, powdery mix. And then you throw in kind of a different levels of lemon juice, 
mustard, like brown mustard, and mayonnaise. And you do that until it's not dripping, but it's kind of a soft consistency. Not too, not too grainy, because if it's too grainy, you didn't add enough liquid. And if it's too liquidy, then you added too much and you can't take it back. So it's always good to start with less liquid and add more later. Then you mix it in, and you stir it up, and you just put it into the little empty egg whites, because you squeeze the egg yolk out of them beforehand. And then here you drizzle them with chopped up, it looks like a spring onions, or green onions, as they call them. You could do that. I prefer putting chives, like freshly cut chives, over them. Or you can also dust them with a little bit of spicy paprika. That's really good. Hot Hungarian paprika over deviled eggs. That is, that is like a childhood staple of mine. But that's really good. But yeah, you can also chop them up into pieces. You can put them into salads. You can put them into soup. Sometimes when I make uh, ramen noodles, I will put, drop a whole egg in there and leave it sit until it solidifies. It becomes, comes like a hard boiled egg. Or you can actually take a whole hard boiled egg, cut it up into pieces and then drop it in. Or something else that I, I picked up over the years is you actually scramble the egg first. And then you pour the scrambled egg into the soup. You still don't touch it for a bit, but you can touch it and start stirring it sooner than you could a regular just whole egg. And it becomes this yellow, foamy, it alters the flavor in a different way than putting a whole egg does. It's again, just experiment with different, different techniques, different ideas. And then poached egg. Poached egg is kind of similar to what you did with the, with the soup, but there's a very specific technique that I saw that I haven't yet been able to, or had the chance to try, but I'm kind of eager to. It's where you take, and this is, this is a credit where credit is due, this is the Gordon Ramsay method. You take a pot of boiling, boiling water, you take a whisk, and you stir the water, the empty water, just with the whisk over and over until you've created like a little whirlpool like a self-sustaining whirlpool. And then very quickly, you drop an egg into just off center. As close to center as you can get, but it might end up just off center, that's okay. And then you just don't touch it. And the natural spinning of the water will send the yolk, the heaviest part, to the middle. And it'll send the lightest part, which are kind of outside in the rim, also heading towards the middle, but slower and afterwards. And as it's moving from the outside to the inside, it's solidifying. So as it's hardening, it's wrapping the egg yolk in this solidifying egg white until it's one solid piece. And then you just take it out and you dunk it and you put it onto a... You're ready to eat. You're ready to serve it. You just got to dry it off a bit, maybe season it a little bit. But that's essentially a fast-paced way to make it uh, kind of eggs over, egg over medium, actually, or hard boiled, depending on how long you leave it in there. Whew, that's a lot of eggs. And we're already two minutes, although we'd start about five minutes late, so we're almost there. Almost done with the halfway point, almost at the halfway point. So that's eggs, that's four different ways of eggs. And then the final bit is the ground meat. Now, you can apply this to ground beef, ground pork, ground chicken, ground lamb, but I'm going with ground beef because in, in my experience, ground beef has the most exaggerated reaction to being cooked. This, in, this reintroduces something that you saw with the broccoli and a little bit of the onion, but mostly the broccoli. That when it's cooked enough to eat, not saying cooked enough to to what your purpose is, like an onion. Like if you you can cook, the, you can eat the onion raw. But if you want a cooked onion, you don't have to cook it until it becomes transparent or until it becomes dark and caramelized. It can be well cooked and tasty before it does that color change. Broccoli, it really inhabits the color, of, the taste of cooked broccoli at the same time it inhabits the color of cooked broccoli, that bright green. Ground beef is very similar. When the color changes all the way, that is at the same time an indicator that it is 
good to eat, safe to eat. So ground beef, it starts very red. And if you cook it, if you cook it kind of slow, it'll turn gray. And then if you keep cooking it, it'll eventually turn dark. Or if you cook it at a higher heat, it'll go straight from red to dark. Like a, not black, but a very dark brown, very charred. So that's an indicator of cooking. But the other two things, the other two points I want to bring up that ground beef allows you to experiment with and explore are this, uh, the sound of a sizzle and deglazing. So the sizzle, that's kind of necessary if you don't want to just boil your beef. You could boil the beef. I think, what is it, that, that Scottish dish, haggis, I think, is boiled meat. Yeah, I think you boil the meat for haggis, if I remember correctly. But for, say, if you're making a meat sauce and you want to just cook the ground beef ahead of time and then mix it with the sauce later, you take the raw ground beef, break it up in the pan, but before it goes into the pan, you got to put a little oil or maybe a little tiny bit, tiny bit, maybe some butter, usually oil. Not too much because the beef depending on how lean it is, could have a lot of oil in it, a lot of fat in it by, by itself. If you get lean beef, you might need a little more oil to help it out. But if you get fatty beef, don't really need to add anything. Like here, this lean beef, like 80, I think it's like 85% lean, 15% fat. That's pretty lean. So, oh, 93% lean, 7%. Oh, that's real lean. Yeah, so that would definitely need that. Definitely need a lot of oil to, to help it out. So you put a little bit, not too much, you don't want to drown it. You don't want to boil it in the oil. Just enough to get it started, but when you put it in and you don't hear anything, it's not ready to go in. You put it in and you hear that sizzle. That's the water inside the beef interacting with the oil, on the hot oil on the pan. When hot oil and water interact, the results are very explosive. The same thing is happening here, but on a much smaller scale. But that's what that sizzle is. And the sizzle means not only is your pan hot enough to adequately cook the meat, but also it means that you're going to get that darken char a lot faster than you would if it wasn't. And the darkened char is really where a lot of the flavor of the ground beef kind of changes and becomes stronger. So I always try to go for that darkened color. So listening, and that's the same thing when you're cooking a chicken, or when you're cooking a steak, or when you're cooking a pork chop, or, or any sort of meat on oil on a frying pan. You need, or even like a, a tuna cake or a crab cake, you want that sizzle. And what you can do ahead of time, before you even put any oil in there, just take the clean, un, un, untouched hot pan, run your fingers under the sink, and just splash a tiny, very tiny, tiny little drop of water. And if you hear that sizzle and you see the water evaporate, that means you can add the oil. Wait a couple seconds, and when you put the meat in, it should sizzle just as much. So that sizzle, especially with the water trick, is knowing, uh, working on your timing. The timing of when you start cooking different foods. It's not always the wisest decision to have everything ready, and then just throw everything into its appropriate heat source as fast as you can. Sometimes you gotta time things things out. You gotta plan, you gotta schedule, you gotta figure out which order you're gonna start and then stop cooking different foods. Like food in the oven. You would start that earlier because it takes a while, so you would end it would end later, near the last. Or like a noodles. Noodles, depending on the type of noodle, can take pretty much a consistent a standard time to cook. Or like a, a hamburger or even ground beef for instance if you have a right good sizzle it won't take nearly as long and if you don't have a sizzle 
but it'll take a lot less time to bring it up to heat for a sizzle rather than to put it in and then wait for it to cook. So that's a little extra patience in the beginning saves you a whole lot of time during the actual cooking process. So this helps get you, when you start not just cooking ground beef by itself, but cooking with other foods in combination, combination it helps you practice your timing, your scheduling, figuring out when you want to start, when you want to stop, and overall you'll have a much more organized cooking experience. And honestly, if you make a mistake, that's how you learn. I learned all my scheduling, my timing skills, by doing it wrong the first time and then figuring out what I should have done and then doing that the next time. That's really the best way that I learn is by making a mistake and then learning from that mistake. So ground beef is a good time, good way to practice that. Now the third point before we break for our water refill is something called deglazing. Now this is something that you can do with the onions and with the ground beef as well. When you cook it and you get that char, either you get the caramelization of the onion or you get the char on the ground beef, sometimes it leaves a little residue on the pan, it leaves a little, little crust on the pan. That is what they call glaze. And in order to deglaze, you add some water-based liquid. Sometimes it's water, sometimes it can be uh, lemon juice, sometimes it can be like a, sometimes people add uh, wine and then they cook off the alcohol or they flambe it. But any more, not oil based, but a water based liquid to it, the water will interact with that glaze and it will basically lift it off the surface of the pan. So now the pan is all clean. And all the flavor that was trapped in that glaze is now re-dissolved into that water and reabsorbed into the actual food that left it behind. So you always, always, always want to deglaze your pan before you're done with your whole dish. Now let's say you want to add some of your meaty flavor into some vegetables. So then you would cook your meat, you'd get that glaze residue on the pan and then you put the meat into a different dish maybe to cool or maybe to add to a different sauce and then maybe you want to throw some vegetables some cook some vegetables in that same pan well that pan now has that meaty glaze on it you throw the vegetables in maybe you throw a little water or the water of the vegetables will naturally kind of soak out and they will lift that glaze off and now you get that meaty flavor mixed in with the vegetables that's another flavor combination you can work with so the possibilities of glazing and deglazing definitely allow you to transfer flavors from food to food. But also the practice of it is very good because you don't want to leave all that flavor behind. No color, no flavor. And if all the color is left behind on the pan, that means all the flavor is left behind on the pan. And you don't want to leave it behind. I have... What is okay? Twitch is Twitch is talking to me. I don't know what it's talking telling me about. Sorry about that. Okay. Da, da, da. Yeah. So deglazing. So what I do is I'll, sometimes I put a little water if I don't have anything else. Well, sometimes I put a bunch of lemon juice and maybe a little extra water to help it out, and that deglazes it. Or sometimes I just throw in like some cherry tomatoes cut up. There's a lot of water in them and that deglazes it, and then I just cook it. I serve it, like right after. So deglazing, sizzling, and another cooking-approved color change. That's what ground beef gives you practice with. Okay, we are right at our hour mark. and We are halfway through our list. The, the rest of the list is actually a bit shorter, so we might be able to get through that sooner. So I'm gonna take a five-minute water refill break and uh, I'll, we'll catch up when we come back.
Hang on. Okay, I, you can hear me, something, something messed up, you can hear me now, there's not a double, there's not a double to that background music, is there? Oh, I had my, oh yeah, I, had, I was watching the stream on Twitch and I had my own thing unmuted. That's what I heard. Yeah, that's what I heard, okay. seconds. See, that's what I don't like about Twitch. You can't just go back a couple seconds and then check if you're unmuted, like beforehand. Like, YouTube, you could do that, but I don't know. I'm not sure if I like using Twitch very often, but I've, I, you know, I committed to using it the next, the next eight streams, or this stream and seven more. So I'm gonna give it at least that much of a chance. And then I'll decide if I want to switch back and forth or just stick with YouTube. Because I'm definitely doing going back to YouTube. It's just do I keep doing Twitch along with it or not. Okay. Also, I just want to mention... Actually, no. We'll jump back in the list. I'll mention that later. Okay, so our next thing on the list... Where is my list? There you are. Okay, so the first half of the list was just talking about food that emphasizes versatility. Food that you can use to practice various cooking skills, various preparation skills, various presentation skills. Um, talked about the onion, how you can practice your different knife work. We talked about how you can practice different combinations of foods with um, like the broccoli the head versus the stem, the different types of pasta, the different methods of cooking eggs. We talked about uh, presentation with the different colors of onions, with the strength and color of broccoli and ground beef, with whether you use different, different forms of egg and how, what role each ingredient plays in terms of flavor, color, and appearance. Well, color is kind of appearance in terms of flavor and appearance in your dish, and the different ways of practicing your cooking, whether you're using your tools or using your utensils to prepare for it. The second half of this list, the, the next five foods, are really just additional. <clears throat> They're things that you can add 
things that benefit your dish because they can be used to accomplish very strong flavors, I would say. The very strong, flavorful foods. Now, many of these can be divisive in terms of people who like, dislike, love, and hate the flavors, but I'm just going to put the list out there, and it will be what it will be. And we're going to start with this one. Now I believe, depending on what part of the world you're in, this has multiple different names, or at least two different names. If you've heard the word coriander, referred to those little, they look a bit like peppercorns, little tiny balls, little tiny pepper balls, and they have a very sharp, kind of bitter taste if you bite into them. To me, that's always been coriander. And what I see here has always been cilantro. But I, fi I think in some parts of the world, they call them both coriander because I think they come from the same plant. The little pepper balls are the seeds and the cilantro you see here is the flower. So some people, when they say add coriander, and then they start and they pull out cilantro. If you don't know that sometimes some people call them one and the same, it can be rather <laughs> confusing. But yeah, I'm gonna call it cilantro because I like distinguishing it from the coriander seeds. So cilantro, I've heard that the people you either love it or you hate it. I'm one of those people that love cilantro. Now, I won't put it on everything, but I do like the flavor. It adds a very fresh taste to whatever you add it to. It makes it ideal for adding to salsas, coleslaws, and salads, because it has a very herby, fresh, kind of just picked off the vine kind of feel, kind of taste to whatever food you add. If you mix it with a salsa, it makes the salsa taste that much more authentic. Like it just came from fruits that were just pulled off of the vine. Or if you add it to coleslaw, it just brightens up the flavor. If you add it to, say, I don't know, any meat dish, it has a nice kind of uh, flowery, not flowery, like it makes the meat taste a bit more herby and fresh. In cilantro, you can cut the flower, you can cut the stem, or you can cut it roughly, you can cut it finely. Again, all different ways you can prepare it. You can leave it whole, just put a single leaf, or you can cut it up and then put whole leaves on afterwards. It's a very decorative herb, very colorful herb, and when you heat it up just a tiny bit, just put a little heat to it, not too much that it wilts, but enough that the color, just like broccoli, it brightens and strengthens, and then you can put it as the centerpiece of your dish and make it just look fancier. So if you have like a finished spaghetti dish, and you just take a single stem, a little single leaf of cilantro, just place it on top, it looks like it's an attempt at being fancy. kind of what it looks like you're attempting to look fancy but if you add a little heat to it maybe you drop it in to a uh, on like a, a dry frying pan for maybe 10 seconds on each side you got a little heat the color might brighten a little bit you take it off the heat is still there it'll still kind of pass through maybe 10 seconds 20 seconds each side and then you put it on, it'll wilt a bit more, but it'll conform to the shape of whatever dish you put it on, and it'll be a little brighter, a little more flavorful. Because especially with seasonings, but also for herbs, heating it draws not just the color, but the flavor out as well. So putting raw herbs is, 
infuse it with caution. Like when you mix in with uh, parsley, you put parsley over uh, like a lasagna. You could do that, and the heat of the lasagna will sort of heat up the parsley. So you don't put like a mountain on it. Just enough so that the lasagna can start heating up the parsley once it's on once it's on there. Scrambled eggs, you can cut up some chives, put it on there. The heat from the eggs will heat up the chives. Cilantro, if you just put a stem just kind of sitting out there, it might not heat up much from the food. So you can kind of bury it a little bit, or put it on a really hot part of the dish, like a steak, and the heat from the steak will heat it up. You can do a number of things. Yeah, heat your herbs. And cilantro is just a very versatile thing to add a little freshness to whatever dish you want. Next up is probably even more divisive than that for one particular reason. Pineapple. Is Poison Tongue a fan of pineapple on pizza? So pineapple can be used to add a little layer of sweetness to a different type of dish. You can, it has a very high water content, very juicy. And so, not all the water leaves when you cook it. It's just like cooking a cherry tomato or a grape tomato. You're heating the water inside, so the water inside the fruit, whether it's a pineapple or a, a little tomato, gets hotter than the actual outer surface of the food. So when you bite into it, all that water floods onto your tongue, it could burn you. It's very hot. But that heat heats up and brings out, makes the flavor stronger as well. So pineapple is good if you want to add a sweetness to maybe a, like, pineapple over ham. Or over, like, a corned beef or roast beef. Heat it up. It's a very sweet addition to a savory dish. Excuse me. all those pierogies I ate. <laughs> and yes, I do like pineapple on my pizza. I will throw pineapple on there. It, it has to be with very specific other toppings for it to work. I don't just take like a, like a cheese, pepperoni, and a sausage, or pepperoni, and pepper pizza and just throw pineapple on there. No, I don't do that. I make sure it's a very in unique combination of toppings. I always do pineapple, spinach, and banana peppers, if I can. Because the banana peppers add a nice tang, the pineapple adds a nice sweetness, and the spinach adds a nice uh, leafy texture that kind of is balanced and offset by the tang and the sweetness of the other two. And then they add whatever meats are on there. So yes, I do like pineapple pizza. But it's also good for, again, stir fries, but also just, say if you're baking fish, just take some chopped up, you can go to the supermarket, get like a can of diced pineapple, just like pour it into a frying pan, cook it up, and then you can have the juice served over some, you can cook the fish in the juice, or you can have your pineapple juice be what you use to deglaze a pan, and then you can have the hot pineapple over the fish, and so you get a fishy pineapple, very Hawaiian kind of food. There's a lot you can do with it. So cilantro for freshness, and pineapple for sweetness. I mentioned banana peppers. That happens to be the third thing. They're very strong flavor. If you're not careful, they will, they and the juice that you put in will overpower a lot of other more subtle flavors. So if you put banana peppers on, say, a Subway sandwich, for instance, which is what I do, be careful what other toppings you throw on there, because they may or may not get overshadowed by the banana peppers, unless you put a tiny bit of banana peppers and a lot of other things. There are some foods that are just naturally stronger flavored than others. Banana peppers is one of them. 
It's very tangy. It's a little bit on the vinegary. Not too much on the vinegary side. A little bit on the sour side. And sometimes on the spicy side. You get mild, you get spicy. It's like a, a tangier, sweeter version of pickles. So that can be used in complement or in contrast to the pineapple. Throw it in with cilantro and you have a nice little beginning uh, salsa glaze you could spread over maybe a steak or a slice of ham or uh, uh, lamb chops if you want. A rack of lamb if you like. I never actually switched over. These are banana peppers. I rarely get them as whole banana whole peppers. I always get like the pre-cut rings. The ones here. They're very good. They're very good. I love them. But I haven't really known, I haven't used a whole pepper yet. That might be my next experiment. To use a whole banana pepper. And just figure out what to do with it. Maybe I'll cut it into strips. Fun fact, that's what they call when you take like a bell pepper. I may have already said this, but if you take a bell pepper and you cut it into really thin strips, it's called Julie. Yeah, I definitely said that. I definitely said that last time. This sounds really familiar. Julienning a pepper. Yeah, I said that before. Okay, next up on the list is a personal favorite of mine, and apparently a personal favorite of Bobby Flay, Master Chef, Master Chef, Iron Chef, Iron Chef, Bobby Flay. Gochujang. Gochujang is a Korean pepper paste. This is kind of what it is. It's very viscous, very viscous. And it comes out of, there's some that come in like a little squeeze bottle. I get the squeeze bottle one. But it is very spicy and very sweet in the way that, say, buffalo sauce. Buffalo sauce is also spicy and has a different kind of flavored sweet, but is also just as sweet. That's also a counter to this. And then, uh, as a third, I threw in sriracha, which is also spicy, and yet a third type of flavored sweetness. Personally, I don't like sriracha sauce. I don't like it. I don't like the flavor. I love the flavor of buffalo sauce, especially um, Frank's Red Hot Buffalo Sauce. Really good. But I think I like Gochujang just a little bit better. It's a different flavor, but it's still very sweet and very spicy. So you have to be very careful how much you use. It's a very thick paste. But it is. But once you acquire a taste for it, it is so good. And it's so strong. It's a very strong flavor, like everything on this second half of the list. It's a very strong flavor. So yeah, so a spicy sweet. And if you don't get your spice in hot banana peppers, you can always add gochujang to that, or buffalo sauce. So we got cilantro, which is fresh. We got pineapple, which is sweet. We got banana peppers, which are tangy. We got gochujang, which is spicy sweet. And then finally, this is the one where I made the misalignment between my last list and this next one. Lemon zest. And lemon juice. You can also do lemon juice. But the main thing is lemon zest. Now lemon zest is really just the shredded outside of a, of a lemon. Now you may have heard like the rind of a fruit. The rind is the white part. So you can see kind of unclear. It's a good picture of it. So like right, right here. You see the center is the actual lemon fruit and then you have this ring of white and then outside the ring of white is a thinner ring of yellow which is the outer shell. The white part is the rind and the inside is the lemon itself but the outer part is what turns into the zest. So you zest using a very fine grater 
which is sometimes a zester, and you just shred it. You just rub the lemon back and forth, or just down the, sh the grater until you see the white start to peek out. You don't want to rub the rind, because the rind will make it very bitter. Just like when you take a bell pepper, and you slice it, and you get the red, like a red bell pepper, and then you get the white little bit on the inside, that's the rind of the pepper. You usually slice that off, because that gets very bitter, and the bell pepper flavor itself you want to preserve. Same thing with the lemon. You want to preserve the, uh, the, the strength of flavor of the lemon zest, and you don't want to mix lemon rind with that. So, you would stop just short, so I barely see white peeking out here. Here you can see white a bit more pronounced, but you want to stop there. And you can get a lot, a lot of lemon zest with just a single lemon, even just stopping short of the white all around. And it's a very strong flavor, like everything else, but it's more like a seasoning. It's like a lemon seasoning. And you can sprinkle it on, let's say you're making... Here's a good recipe that I had a while back. You take little russet potatoes, little like fist-sized potatoes, smaller than that. You chop them into wedges. You put them on a tray. You drizzle them with a little olive oil, salt, and pepper, ready to roast them. And then you drizzle, you sprinkle lemon zest all over them. So now you have roasted lemony potato, potato fries, essentially lemon fries. They're very good. Be careful when you cook them, because they can set off your fire alarm. All the starch being cooked off. But yeah, lemon zest. And you can also zest an orange. You can zest any citrusy fruit. A lime zest. I've done mixed lime zest in with uh, white rice and butter. A very buttery, limey rice. It's very good for... Like, uh, if you're adding in with a, a beef or a sauce or like a tortilla, that kind of food. You can do lemon noodles, which is good for like a shrimp scampi, lemon zest over shrimp and noodles and broccoli and tomato and little spinach. Or you can just do uh, orange zest over, say, ice cream, vanilla ice cream, orangey vanilla ice cream, <laughs> a fruity, fruity freshness to a regular dessert or yogurt even just like plain vanilla yogurt a little orange zest on top beautiful now the lemon juice can be a bit sour a bit tangy kind of like the banana peppers and the lemon zest is just a lemony flavor but doesn't really have a lot of that sourness added to it i am dehydrated today so there you have it. There is my list. That's the last one on the list. So lemon zest. So we've talked about the five foods for expanding your versatility and practice in the kitchen with your different tools, utensils, and expanding the lessons to other ingredients, starting from the onion, broccoli, pasta, eggs, and ground beef. And we talked about five foods that are very strong flavors and can add a whole lot to any dish even by themselves. We were cilantro, pineapple, banana peppers, gochujang or buffalo sauce or sriracha, and lemon juice and lemon zest. So for those who are thinking about exploring different foods and starting to, they want to get better at cooking but they don't know where to start. Well, last week we gave you a list of equipment you can use, start learning how to use, and this week we finished off with a list of ingredients. You can just go out, they're not terribly expensive, just bring back and start cooking in different ways. Practice your cooking skills, practice using your tools, practice switching back and forth, practice figuring out what tools help with different cooking methods and what ones make it more difficult. Practice what different combinations of foods and how you cook them and how much you cook them or how little you cook them affects the final product in terms of how it looks, in terms of how it tastes, and in terms of how easy or difficult it is to actually do. 
and then you just kind of find your comfort zone of what you can comfortably cook and you start from there establish your comfort zone and then you just slowly bit by bit start expanding outward try a different different experiment every so often you just go out maybe you buy a lime maybe you go out and you buy a red onion maybe you go out and you buy a uh, whole wheat or lentil pasta maybe you go out and you start making stuff for deviled eggs maybe you want to add some broccolini or maybe you want to throw in some cauliflower or eggplant or zucchini cucumber all these things you can do all the similar techniques that you can on these first five and all the concepts of strength and additions of the second five to a whole bunch of other produce that you find in the supermarket whether it be vegetables fruit meats grains and pastas other things like sauces like marinara pesto alfredo um, anything is salad dressings even there's so much you can do and I can understand it can be overwhelming if you don't really know where to start so hopefully this gave you a good place to start your culinary adventure so it looks like we got about 20 minutes or so, so I'm going to bring us back to you. There we go. Did that transition well? Yes, it did. So overall, I think we're done talking about cooking. A um, little scheduling stuff. So next week, I forget if I said that next week we were going to do our second Name That Tune. I'm actually going to push that back by one month so now it's we're gonna I'm gonna try to make it consistent so every two months is a new name that too so that gives people two months to make their guesses and for me to come up with a new list it's only going to be five songs per this time around because they're not going to be so much of a, of a throwaway anymore they're going to be actual songs that they need to you know practice and get get figure out how to make the how to make it sound with the right instrument and like sound pretty good without giving too much away but also making it interesting that you can kind of figure it out if you already know what it is you know just some more preparation time mixed in with all the other prep work I'm doing for all these other streams so next week and we're not doing a name that too next week is actually going to be the start of our blender modeling experience so there's another background that I want to work on, as well as another background theme that'll go with it. So we're going to work on the background, because we've already talked about how to compose music, and I've shown you that with this background theme we hear now. So I'm going to delve into Blender next week, and we're going to show you from start to finish how I use Blender, how I set it up, the things I've learned, understood, copied, and all the different shortcuts and what's useful, what's not useful, what I use all the time, what I use some of the time, what I never use, and most of the stuff that I have no idea what it does. And we're going to go into it. So if you ever want to use 3D modeling, or if you wanted to get into animation, which Blender can also animate, then that could be a good kickoff, kickoff point for you. So if you notice though, kind of a recurring theme with all my streams so far, it's kind of starting off, whether you want to start off with writing music, you want to start off with writing uh, a, a fiction story, whether you want to start off with uh, cooking, when you start off modeling, you want to start off modeling 3D design, not the other modeling. You want to start off doing all this stuff. That's kind of, kind of what I'm going for, at least in the first bit. Just setting up a whole bunch of, hey, I want to see, I wish I could do this, but it looks hard, and I want to say, well, no, it's not difficult. It just takes patience and a little learning curve. Help, let me help you get started. And that's what I'm pretty much trying to do here. So, next week we're going to jump into Blender. We're going to still be on Twitch. For the next seven streams, we'll still be on Twitch. But I will make an announcement of each one uh, on my YouTube channel as a, as a community post, like I did this time. Um, yeah, it's too bad that you can't schedule 
as well as you can on YouTube for Twitch, but I'm still learning the ins and outs of what you can and can't do on, on the Twitch platform. And I've never given it a shot, so I'm practicing what I preach. I thought Twitching, <laughs> streaming on Twitch would be unnecessary, but I thought I might want to give it a shot. So here I am, giving it a shot. So, that is it for this week. Next week, Blender, probably for two, maybe three streams after that, depends on how far we get. And then at the eighth Twitch stream, the week after that, I'll decide whether I want to go back to YouTube. Probably will, just for one, maybe one or two streams. And then maybe I'll jump back and forth, but we'll really see. That's kind of what I'm looking for. And with that, our stream is over. So thank you for coming, switching platforms. And until next time, keep on making. <laughs>